Though the sisters were Fonny's sisters, I had never thought of them as his sisters. Well, that's not true. If they had not been Fonny's sisters, I would never have noticed them at all. Because they were his sisters, and I knew that, they didn't really like Fonny. I hated them. They didn't hate me. They didn't hate anybody. And that was what was wrong with them. They smiled at an invisible host of stricken lovers as they entered our living room. And Adrian, the oldest, who was 27, and Sheila, who was 24, went out of their way to be very sweet with raggedy, butted, raggedy ass me. Just like the missionaries had told them. All they really saw was that big black hand of my father's, which held them at the waist, of course. My daddy was really holding me at the waist, but it was somehow like it was them. They did not know whether they disapproved of its color, its position, or its shape, but they certainly disapproved of its power of touch. Adrian was too old for what she was wearing, and Sheila was too young. Behind them were, came Frank, and my father loosened his hold on me a little. We chattered and chattered into the living room. Mr. Hunt looked very tired, but he still had that smile. He sat down on the sofa near Adrian, and he said, So, you saw my big-headed boy today, did you? Yes, he's fine. He sends his love. They ain't giving him too hard a time? I just ask you like that because, you know, he might say things to you he wouldn't say to me. Lover's secrets, said Adrian, and crossed her legs and smiled. I didn't see any reason at all to deal with Adrian, at least not yet. Neither did Mr. Hunt, who kept watching me. I said... Well, he hates it, you can see that, and he should, but he's very strong, and he's doing a lot of reading and studying. I looked at Adrian. He'll be all right, but we have to get him out of there. Frank was about to say something when Sheila said, sharply, if he'd done his reading and studying when he should have, he wouldn't be in there. I started to say something, but Joseph said quickly, You bring that six-pack man, or I got some gin and we got whiskey and we got some brandy, he grinned. Ain't got no Thunderbird, though, he turned to Mrs. Hunt. I'm sure you ladies wouldn't mind. Mrs. Hunt smiled. Mind? Frank does not care if we mind. He will go right on and do what he pleases him. He ain't never thought about nobody else. Mrs. Hunt, said Sharon, what can I get you, sugar? I can offer you some tea or coffee, and we got ice cream and Coca-Cola. And seven up, said Ernestine. I can make you a kind of ice cream soda. Come on, Sheila, you want to help me? Sit down, Mama. We'll get it together. She dragged Sheila into the kitchen. Mama sat down next to Mrs. Hunt. Lord, she said, the time sure flies. We ain't hardly seen each other since this trouble started. Don't say a word. I have been running myself sick all up and down the Bronx, trying to get the very best legal advice I can find from some of the people I used to work for. You know, one of them is a city councilman, and he knows just everybody, and he can pull some strings. People just got to listen to him, you know? But it's been taking up all of my time, and the doctor says I must be careful. He says I'm putting an awful strain on my heart. He says, Mrs. Hunt, you got to remember, don't care how much that boy wants his freedom, he wants his mother too. But look like it, does, it don't matter to me. 
I ain't worried about me. The Lord hold me up. I just pray and pray and pray that the Lord will bring my boy to the light. That's all I pray for every day and every night. And then sometimes I think that maybe this is the Lord's way of making my boy think on his sins and surrender his soul to Jesus. You might be right, said Sharon. The Lord sure works in mysterious ways. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Hunt. Now he may try you, but he ain't never left none of his children alone. What you think, Sharon asked, of the lawyer, Mr. Hayward, that Ernestine found. I haven't seen him yet. I just have not had time to get downtown, but I know Frank saw him. What do you think, Frank? Sharon asked. Frank shrugged. It's a white boy who's been to a law school and he got them degrees. Well, you know, I ain't got to tell you what that means. It don't mean shit. Frank, you're talking to a woman, said Mrs. Hunt. I'm hip and it's a mighty welcome change. Like I was saying, I don't mean shit and I ain't sure we're gonna stay with him. On the other hand, as white boys go, he's not so bad. He's not as full of shit now because he's hungry. As he may be later when he's full. Man, he said to Joseph, You know, I don't want my boy's life in the hands of those white, ballless mofos. I swear to Christ, I'd rather be boiled alive. That's my only son, man. My only son. But we all in the hands of white men, and I so I know some very hinchy black cats I wouldn't trust either. But I keep trying to tell you, I keep trying to tell you, cried Mrs. Hunt, that it's that negative attitude which is so dangerous. You're so full of hate. If you give people hatred, they will give it back to you. Every time I hear you talk this way, my heart breaks and I tremble for my son, sitting in a dungeon which only the love of God can bring him out of. Frank, if you love your son, give up this hatred. Give it up. It will fall on your son's head. It will kill him. Frank's not talking hatred, Mrs. Hunt, Sharon said. He's just telling the truth about life in this country, and it's only natural for him to be upset. I trust in God, said Mrs. Hunt. I know he cares for me. I don't know, Frank said, how God expects a man to act when his son is in trouble. Your God crucified his son, and this probably glad to get rid of him. But I ain't like that. I ain't hardly going to be in the street and kiss the first white cop I see. But I'll be a very loving mofo the day my son walks out of that hellhole, free. I'll be loving mofo when I hold my son's head between my hands again and look into his eyes. Oh, I'll be full of love that day. He rose from the sofa and walked over to his... wife and if i don't go down like that you can bet i'm going to blow some heads off and if you say a word to me about that jesus you've been talking with all these years i'll blow your head off first you was making it with that white jew bastard when you should have been with your son mrs hunt put her head in her hands and frank slowly crossed the room again and sat down Adrian looked at him and she started to speak, but she didn't. It was sitting on the ha- I was sitting on the hassock near my father. Adrian said, Mr. Rivers, exactly what is the purpose of this meeting? You haven't called us all the way over here just to watch my father insult my mother. Why not? I said. It's Saturday night. You can tell that people won't you can tell what people won't do if they get bored enough. Maybe we just invite you over to liven things up. I can't believe, she said, that you're that malicious, but I can't believe you're that stupid. 
I haven't seen you twice since your brother went to jail, I said, and I ain't never seen you down at the tombs. Fanny told me he saw you once, and you was in a hurry then, and you ain't said a word about it on your job, I bet, have you? And you ain't said a word about it to none of them white collars, ex-anti-poverty program pimps and hustlers and faggots you run with, have you? And you sitting on that sofa right now thinking you're finer than Elizabeth Taylor and all upset because you got some half honky chump waiting for you somewhere. And you done had to take time out of out something about your brother. Mrs. Hunt was staring at me with terrible eyes. A cold, bitter smile played on Frank's lips. He looked down. Adrian looked at me from a great distance, adding one more tremendous black mark against her brother's name. And finally, as I had known all along, she wished to do, lit a cigarette. She blew the smoke carefully and delicately delicately into the air and seemed to be resolving, in silence, that she would never again, for any reason, allow herself to be trapped among people so unrespectful unspeakably inferior to herself. Sheila and Ernestine re-entered, Sheila looking rather frightened, Ernestine looking grimly pleased. She served Mrs. Hunt her ice cream, set down a Coke near Adrian, gave Joseph a beer, gave Frank a 7-Up with gin, gave Sheila a Coke, gave Sharon a 7-Up with gin, gave me a brandy, and took a highball for herself. Happy landing, she said cheerfully, and she sat down and everybody else sat down. There was then this funny silence and everyone was staring at me. I felt Mrs. Hunt's eyes more malevolent, more frightened than ever. She was leaning forward, one hand tight on the spoon buried in her ice cream. Sheila looked terrified. Adrian's lips curled in a contemptuous smile, and she leaned forward to speak, but her father's hand, hostile, menacing, rose to check her. She leaned back. Frank leaned forward. My news was, after all, for him. And looking at him, I said, I called the summit meeting. I had Daddy ask you all to come over so I could tell you what I had to tell Fonny this afternoon. Fonny's going to be a father. We're going to have a baby. Frank's eyes left mine to search my father's. Both men then went away from us, sitting perfectly still on the chair, on the sofa. They went away together, and they made a strange journey. Frank's face on this journey was awful, in the biblical sense. He was picking up stones and putting them down. His sight forced itself to search itself beyond horizons he had never dreamed of. When he returned, still in company with my father, his face was very peaceful. You and me going to go out and get drunk, he told Joseph. Then he grinned, looking almost just like Fanny, and he said, I'm glad, Tish. I'm mighty glad. And who, asked Mrs. Hunt, is going to be responsible for this baby? The father and the mother, I said. Mrs. Hunt stared at me. You can bet, Frank said, that it won't be the Holy Ghost. Mrs. Hunt stared at Frank, then rose and started walking toward me, walking very slowly and seeming to hold her breath. I stood up and moved to the center of the room, holding mine. I guess you call your lustful action love, she said. I don't. I always knew that you would be the destruction of my son. You have a demon in you. I always knew it. My God caused me to know it many a year ago. The Holy Ghost will cause that child to shrivel in your womb, but my son will be forgiven. My prayers will save him. She was ridiculous and majestic. She was testifying, but Frank laughed and walked over to her. 
and with the back of his hand knocked her down. Yes, she was on the floor, her hat way on the back of her head and her dress up above her knees, and Frank stood over her. She did not make a sound, nor did he. Her heart, murmured Sharon, and Frank laughed again.